but I feel this urge to grin. If I try to charm you in, that's just the mood that I'm in. If I wanna act real cool, that's just the way that I feel. You don't have to buy my stuff if you don't like my deal. I'm the one mama warned you about. I'm the guy mama told you about. Take another look and then look out. Mama warned you. I'm the one mama warned you about. I'm the guy mama told you about. Take another look and then look out. Oh, she should have. And a good Thursday morning to you. I am Tommy Parker, and welcome to Vicksburg Today on News Talk 1490. Got it a little hot this morning. Somebody's been playing with the microphones again, blowing myself up, or, or maybe cleaning my ears finally worked. <laughs> Who knows? Dalen, as usual, is over here tinkering. So, uh, Hopefully we got the rain out of the way, and we're going to... Go back to God knows what this weather forecast is going to be. I mean, we, we, we're in the middle of El Nino, La Nina, and who the hell knows what else. I mean, what do you, whatever you want to call it. Uh, cra- crazy weather that is Mississippi. Right now it's 45 in downtown Vicksburg, calling for sunny today and a high near 55. Mostly clear tonight and a low near 32. Time to break out the uh, fuzzy socks, people. Sunny tomorrow, high near 53, clear tomorrow night, a low around 31. Uh, we're going to do similar to that throughout the weekend. Uh, let's see. Monday night, well, let's see, Monday in the late afternoon and Monday night, chance of rain moving back in and staying through Tuesday. So, who knows, people? I, you know, I just read what they put on the sheet. <laughs> Good morning. Joining us this morning on the program is a gentleman I've uh, been been following his career for, for a good while now. Local gentleman, Alexander Stephen Brown. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, you grew up here in Vicksburg, went to Vicksburg High, I believe. I did. Uh, graduated 2003. Now, you've, uh, as we touched on, you, you a lot of people know you from the now dearly departed bookstore in the mall, but a lot of people don't realize that you have become a fairly successful author. Well, thank you. Um, it's taken a lot of years of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, uh, a lot of coffee. I'm surprised I was able to quit smoking in the process of this journey, but I was able to. And um, I've uh, been doing conventions, book signings, um, speaking to the public and uh, really gaining an online um, presence for myself for maybe about the last five, six years now. Now, what influenced you growing up to, to want to get into to writing? I mean, what was there, was, there, was there that light bulb moment in school where you said, I want to write a book? Uh, it was, yeah. Um, I would say that my love for books was inspired by my Aunt Carrie Laird. And uh, she had a room that was nothing but an entire library from wall to wall, roof to floor. And uh, going over there, I was always fascinated with the uh, books that she had. She had a lot of classics, a lot of contemporary pieces. And um, when I got into about fifth or sixth grade, that's when I really started to admire books. And I started with Goosebumps. And uh, after a few of those books, I graduated to Stephen King. So I was in sixth grade, starting with uh, Stephen King in the adult reading level and uh, continuing on with Clive Barker, Anne Rice, uh, H.P. Lovecraft, which uh, Lovecraft took me a little while to understand. I didn't really grab him until high school, but um, those were my major influences. And as I was reading books by these authors, it uh, inspired me to tell stories of myself. I've always been um, a big ghost story lover, a camp fire story lover and so a lot of my work deals with folklore especially in the southern regions and um, as a matter of fact uh, for Seventh Star Press that's based out of Kentucky I um, became the co-editor of the series Southern Haunts which uh, we do now have volume three available and uh, that series is about the only series I've contributed to that is intended for young adult, unless you want to consider my steampunk work, which that's uh, young adult friendly as well. But my standalone novels or short story collections such as Serenthia Falls or Traumatized, uh, that's strictly for the adult audience. 
Now, at what point did you write your first book? Well, uh, the first actual book I wrote has never been published. Um, and God only knows what happened to it. Back in the days when we had floppy disk, <laughs> um, the first story I wrote was a uh, gator pit. And it was about this um, sister who hated her twin. She kidnaps her to take her into the middle of nowhere and of, uh, make it look like someone else murdered her. And in the process of this happening, she stumbles across a man who owns a gator pit, and it just so happens he's a maniac, and he feeds people to his gators. And um, I was maybe about 15, 16 when I uh, wrote this, and it's never seen the light of day because I later discovered in life that there was a movie by Toby Hooper called Eden Alive, and it followed the same premise pretty much, so I just scrapped that. <laughs> Were, were going through school, were, were, there, were there teachers or anyone like that that, you know, reached down and, and influenced you and kind of... Oh, definitely. Um, as a matter of fact, I can think of uh, three teachers just off the top of my head. Uh, one is uh, Melody Romeo, which uh, she wrote the uh, fictionalized historic uh, version of Vlad. And uh, also, when I started editing for Southern Haunts, accepting short stories, I invited her to be a part of that series, and uh, she started contributing from volume two up. Um, Melody Romeo was the first time I'd ever met an author, because I believe it was my senior year, and uh, that's when I had heard she'd published Vlad, and so I kind of fanboyed a little bit. And uh, so that was one inspiration. Another was my art teacher, uh, Joyce Brown. Uh, she really pushed me to um, be everything I could. She really uh, taught me to have an artistic eye. And when you write, it's almost um, like you're painting or creating photography. And uh, so that really helped from the visionary standpoint. Uh, also, when I was in uh, my senior year, I had creative writing, and um, my teacher was Miss Jacoby, and she was just a godsend, truly. Uh, she pretty much explained to the class that we had no limits but the limits we set for ourselves. And with that semester of creative writing, unfortunately, it didn't last a year but just half a semester, it was uh, some of the best growth that I ever had in life. And as a matter of fact, a few of the short stories that I wrote in that class can be found in Traumatized. Moving away from, from that, well, I often find that, that when a book is taken and made into a television series or a movie, it loses a whole lot in the translation. It does. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on expounding on that? I mean, from from the books that you've been a fan of and then go, gone to see the movie, do you, do you find that, I, in a lot of cases, I leave out disappointed, going, well, they left to me what were the key parts out. Exactly. You know, it 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 always, like I said, seems to lose a little bit in the translation. And, uh, and it does. Um, I still stand by the belief that the book is better than the movie, or um, if you have a movie that's equivalent to the book, that is possible. Um, I really haven't seen uh, too many American movies that have been true to the books. The Hunger Games series was fairly true to the books. I, I was pretty pleased with those. Um, but uh, I believe that the Swedish... Uh, entertainment is more serious to matching the movie with the book examples of this would be the girl with the dragon tattoo series the swedish version of those movies i didn't see the american one but the swedish version followed the books almost identically and i was very pleased with that and there's also an author by the name of john avid lindquist who wrote the book uh, Let Me In, and uh, it inspired the Swedish movie Let the Right One In, which was also very true to the book. And then there was the American remake um, Let Me In, which I enjoyed that one too. But uh, it, it, with that one, it's uh, it was really interesting to see the foreign difference and the American difference because both movies did pull from the book in great detail, but they did it in different aspects. Well, one of the things, going back to a, another part of my lifetime, 
I, when I when I was in law enforcement, we took a class and they staged an incident and they had each one of us write the incident down. Everybody's version is different. Everybody reads a book and gets different things. In many books, I find that that I really enjoy. I have to after I finish them, put them down, let them sit for a little, and then go back and read them a second time. And I always come away with different things on the second and third reading. That's very true, and uh, it's really interesting that you mention this. Uh, I just came from the convention Geekonomicon that's located in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. They do it once a year in December, and uh, some of the authors that I met down there this time, uh, one was another horror author who expressed that um, he had sold his novel, and then one of the people he sold his novel to returned to him at a future signing, and explained about how graphic this um, scene was that uh, was in regards to an abusive relationship. And he, as the reader is explaining on and on and on about how gruesome this scene was and so forth, he was thinking to himself, did I really make it that bad? And when he opened up his book and reread what he had wrote, it was nothing more than just a few sentences. It was this person who it struck them so greatly it ended up making it where they felt it went for pages and pages and pages and uh, I think that's the beauty one of the main uh, beauties of being an author is uh, when you can simply sum up a scene in three or four sentences but make the reader feel like it was so impactful that it lasted about 15 16 pages the old the the old schoolers in, in our industry in the radio business said that radio was the theater of the mind. But uh, to me, the, um, it's kind of a chicken or an egg thing because years ago, before the advent of television, obviously, many of your your programs were actually produced and, and done on radio. And, and just as you said, uh, a lot of times it's in it's the phraseology and the delivery uh is, is what sets the tone in certain aspects of a book as well. It is, and uh, actually I've kind of grown to love the old school shows that were on the radio. If you go to uh, iTunes, you can type in a plethora of key terms that will bring up old school uh, radio shows where when TV wasn't in the living room and the radio was there, you would have uh, the dramas and the sagas and short stories that just would come across the speakers and entertain families actually we carry a program i, th I think it now i'm gonna sound dumb i think it's on saturday night to, that flashes back to a lot of those great programs but um now you you said you mentioned the 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 geekology the uh you you've been going to a lot of these festivals and and tell tell our listeners I've been to a couple of comic cons through the wrestling business. Matter of fact, I got the paperwork yesterday. We're going to be doing several next year. But uh, man, I, I was shocked. I went to one a couple of years ago in Little up in Little Rock. The turnout for these things is tremendous. It is, and uh, you have so many people that come together. Um, may it be gender, race, whatever. They're all there for the same reason, and it's just to geek out and have fun. And um, cosplay is becoming really big now. <laughs> uh, I was I was, I was going to bring that up. I was amazed at, at at the the costumes for the cosplay. I was like, man, some of these people got thousands of dollars to, and a lot of time tied up in exactly. these things. Exactly, and uh, I mean, you can always tell a great cosplay costume. Uh, when a person makes it themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, what a lot of the conventions have been like that I've attended, is uh, when I go to a convention, I consider I might be lucky to grab a snack or two, and for the rest of the day I'm signing books, I'm speaking on panels, meeting the public, and uh, during this time I'll um, get to meet people who are similar to me, who are already authors, I will meet people who are aspiring authors and they're trying to get into the business. Then there's the cosplayers. And as a matter of fact, this uh, last uh, November, I took my mom to her first big con. And it was like seeing um, a 60-year-old woman turn six again and stand in front of the toy shop. 
it was it, it's something for all ages. It, it really it, is. That, that was another aspect of it. The the the, the classic toys. Uh, I mean, toys from from the classic era all the way up to today. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, there's there's literally if you and, and there the Mississippi Comic Con was this past weekend. My good friend Jim Duggan was over there signing autographs. Um, there's literally if you've never been to one. You need to go because there's something that's going to catch. Whether you're a fan of comic books, classic toys, uh, the the cosplay, which is the costumes that are mm-hmm. in a lot of these movies and television shows, I still go back to the one in Little Rock, the 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 guy who had the uh, Ghostbusters outfit. That I'm I've still got pictures of him. I mean, obviously this guy had spent a lot of time and a lot of money. <laughs> I've seen everything from uh, the robotic dog from um, Doctor Who to life-size TARDISes. Uh, one of the costumes that I saw this uh, last weekend at Geekonomicon that really impressed me was uh, there was a girl who had um, taken a shower curtain ring and she had it on a harness so it was attached to her back. Now. Um, the curtain of the shower uh, curtain ring was of the TARDIS. And so she had it open so she could see out, but you could see the TARDIS around her. Within, uh, as she was dressed, she was dressed as Marty McFly from Back to the Future. So she was combining her fandom of Back to the Future and Doctor Who, and the two worked really well in the comparison. Um, But for people who have never been to a con and you are interested uh, to contribute to the arts or to literature, going to conventions is the number one place you would want to be. The best advice I can give any author out there is if you stumble across a publisher that says, we can publish you if you pay us this much money. Don't do it because pretty much what they're doing is you're just paying them to print your work. They're not going to help you expand in any sort of way. But at a convention, what you can do is you can meet authors, editors, publishers, and sometimes agents who can direct you in the correct way of uh, pursuing your artistic career. And uh, in the process of doing this, I have actually seen at conventions before where publishers will hold a panel, and for that entire panel, they invite new authors to pitch their story to them, and if they're interested, they will go in and sign that author on the spot. And I'm so glad you brought that up, because last week I had, I had Miss Doris Brown on. She self-published a book, and by the way, she's going to be back out at the outlet mall this uh, this Saturday afternoon signing copies of it. But she brought up the fact that years ago she had tried, and she, she still got all her rejection letters. Mm-hmm. And now the opportunities are out there like never before for people to get their work out there. What was the process like initially for you? Oh, it was, at the time, a lot of cigarettes and a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty much um, when I first started pushing Traumatized, it was a collection of 15 short stories, and uh, they all focused on a different aspect of the horror genre. Uh, when I started uh, hunting around for a publisher to represent me, uh, I did get back rejection letters, and um, at that time, Twilight was popular. And uh, some of the letters I received back said, well, this isn't Twilight material. And I'm like, well, that's not what I write. And uh, so I did went on and I I did the uh, ex libris way of publishing my book, which, I mean, they're honest to you. They'll tell you, well, if you pay us X amount of dollars, we're going to publish you. But if you want this book edited once, it's going to cost you this amount of dollars. If you want it edited twice, it'll cost you this much more. If you want us to advertise it, it'll cost you more. And so nothing they do is to really help the author except just kind of drain your money. And um, that was the experience I had with Traumatized. But the thing that helped me with it, is since I was very new to the scene and I had no idea that conventions were this close to me or what I could gain from conventions, um, I pushed the book as far as I could and then I was discovered back in the MySpace days by Chuck Jett. He's an artist in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, he invited me to his PulpCon. 
And by doing that, I met the um, group known as a Magicopter. It's a uh, free service. It's a nonprofit organization so that authors and artists can come together and learn about other events. And uh, by doing this, I started getting into the conventions and uh, I ended up meeting Dark Oak Press. Well, what is now Dark Oak Press, it used to be Kerlack Publishing. And uh, when I met the author Kimberly Richardson, she and I purchased each other's books. And um, the next time I saw her, which was about a year later, uh, we kind of gushed over one another where she's like, oh my God, your book scared me. And I said, oh my God, you're so sick. And it, her book tells of a goth librarian. It is a uh, very um, nightmarish. And so we instantly gained a love for one another. And she was already established with Dark Oak Press. And at this time, she had grabbed me and uh, said to her publisher, you've got to publish this guy. And uh, I started writing steampunk short stories for them. And then um, after I published a few of those. Now explain to our listeners what, I'm sorry. <laughs> what steampunk is. Okay. No. Uh, steampunk, uh, the simplest way to imagine steampunk <laughs> is imagine what would happen if we never advanced past the Victorian era and everything was ran by steam. You have the Victorian fashion and at the same time you have at your fingertips to create anything that is steam powered. Okay. No, no, go on. <laughs> and uh, so I was contributing steampunk stories to them in the uh, Dreams of Steam anthologies. And at this time, at this time, I pitched to the publisher I wanted to have a werewolf novel released. And uh, he said, well, what's going to set it aside from other werewolf novels? Why am I going to want this? And so I told him the research that I did that was European-based and also Haitian voodoo-based. And he said, all right, well, that hasn't been done in the mainstream before. So anyway, um, he said, let me see what you got. And that's how Serenthia Falls got published. And as a matter of fact, uh, Serenthia is about to have its own uh, tea blend come out. So uh, as you read Serenthia Falls, be sure to check my Facebook page for a blend of tea called uh, the Serenthia Blend. And uh, you might want to drink it while you read the book. But um, self-publishing isn't the key of, uh, well, it's not the kiss of death that it used to be. And the key is uh, for you to just mingle with what you already have to the crowd that you're introduced to. And I'm no longer representing myself independently. I am uh, published by all small or medium houses. And Traumatized has been discontinued with the self-publication of Ex Libris. And it was picked up by Pro Se Press as a special edition last year. So what, what, what else have you got out there? I see you got some books over there. Let's, yeah, let's, um, let's. I brought a copy of uh, Serenthia Falls for everyone at the radio station to enjoy uh pretty much with that i wanted to write a throwback to the old school werewolf uh theme such as the old black and white wolf man american werewolf in london i grew up watching dracula dracula is <laughs> a favorite too and uh what was dark shadows oh, yeah. dark dark shadows used to come on in the afternoons well, I, I found uh, the entire series at a pawn shop in mint condition on DVD for like 30 bucks. I bought it. Haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but hopefully soon. I, I, I often enjoy going back and watching shows like that one. I think that one is one that will hold up even in this era. I agree. I agree because uh, it has elements that the fandom at that time was uh, surprised by because at that time you either had horror sci-fi drama whatever and this one ended up bringing all of those elements together and so it gained a fandom from people that necessarily wasn't into horror but were into drama and people that were not into drama but horror they were pulled into it from the horror aspect and truth be it, that's what I try to do with my own books. Uh, Serenthia Falls is a book where the lead character is bullied quite a bit in high school. And it's a book that really focuses on child abuse, peer pressure, bullying. And uh, even though we have those aspects in there, uh, it is a werewolf novel as well. 
And uh, one of my readers uh, returned to my table this last weekend, and it was one of the best compliments I had received. Uh, she said, Cerinthia Falls was extremely touching. She said it had a lot of heart to it, but at the same time, it almost made her want to puke. <laughs> so that, a, that, that was great. That, that, <laughs> that's a unique uh, compliment in its own way, I guess. It is. It's uh, it's uh, kind of both ends of the spectrum, and it made me happy. So, well, <laughs> tell me this: do do you find that now, like like I mentioned, I'm in the wrestling business. Mm -hmm. We got more closet wrestling fans who never admit that they watch it. Do you find that there are a lot of closet fans of of the this genre oh, people, God, people, yeah. <laughs> people from every spectrum the guy you would go i'd never expect him to read my book oh yeah definitely um there's been uh signings that i've done before where these sweet little grandmotherly women have come up to me and they've purchased a copy of traumatized and uh i've explained to them in advance uh, i'm like well you know this uh this might be a little much, but it is 15 stories, so you can pick and choose whichever one you like. You don't have to finish off a story. Just go to the next one. <laughs> and uh, this one sweet little lady came back to me, and uh, she had at this time purchased Cerinthia Falls after reading Traumatized and said, oh, oh, the things that happened in that book. Oh, it was so disturbing and so sick. And she's holding on to Cerinthia Falls while she's saying this. And uh, I said, well, um, the Cerinthia Falls isn't going to be as brutal, but it almost is to that level. And she said, oh, good, here's my money. <laughs> so it, it's, it's always interesting to see that the demographic you think you're going to receive is uh, always changed. It's always different with each region and, peop and uh, area that you speak in. Now, what, outside of Cerinthia Falls, what, what, what are you working on now? Well, uh, at the moment, I am getting the guidelines together for Southern Haunts Part 4. Uh, the first book deals about ghosts, the second one about devils, and the third one about witches. The fourth book will focus on creatures, and this includes aliens. And uh, pretty much I'm working on the guidelines for that. I'm going to open those guidelines next October. And... Um, also, I am finishing a novel called The Looking Glass Creatures. It's probably the most difficult book I've ever worked on. It's a period piece set in the 15th century, and uh, the difficult part of this is getting the weaponry correct and also the dialogue correct. Uh, building the castle, that wasn't too hard to work with. I was able to do that pretty well, but I'm on the last uh, 25 pages of editing that, so it should be released in 2016. And uh, Traumatized Part 2, uh, that finally became completed, and now the editing process will begin on that. Um, other than that, I'm outlining the sequel to Cerinthia Falls. What, from, from start to finish, how long does it take to do a book? There, I know every one of them is different. That's is a very subjective question, but just, um, just ballpark. Well, when it comes down to editing an anthology such as Southern Haunts, um, it can take about two or three months for us to simply read all of the submissions. And I work with a co-editor, so she and I discuss the stories together. And also there's an inside reader that we try to keep her oblivious to who wrote what stories so she doesn't have any favoritism. And uh, the three of us actually discuss each story, see if it fits the book. And so that takes about two or three months. And then to actually edit the book where it becomes um, suitable for reading, that would take probably about another three to four months. So simply for an anthology to be out, you're looking at the total of six to seven months to do. Now for a novel, it's much different because... Uh, I try to write every day, and a novel, it takes on a life of its own because you're not limited to 4,000 words for a short story. And uh, so this has the ability to be as long as you see for it to be, as long as your characters are willing to live. And um, pretty much, Cerinthia Falls, it was a trunk novel when it was published because I was working on Traumatized at that time, and Traumatized took me about two years to get everything together before it was released with Ex Libris. 
And then with Cerinthia Falls, that was something I had worked on over the total of three to four years. And then when I found that it had a home, the editing process took about a year, and it was about 17 times a read and over the book. And uh, with the process that I'm on with Looking Glass Creatures right now, it, it took me about a year to write it, and it's been in editing for the last two and a half years. So, it, and uh, when you're working with a period piece, that can happen because after you get everything tied together and you have everything that uh, is uh, crossed with your T's and dotted with your I's and the punctuation's correct, at that point you have to say, okay, do the fight scenes work? Does the weaponry work? Is this how they really spoke back then? And that's where your research comes in even more. And with the editing, sometimes you'll add more, sometimes you'll take away more. And so that's where we've been with Looking Glass Creatures. Any, uh, any chance we'll see any of this developed into a, a TV show or, or a movie? Has there been any nibbles, possibly? Well, it, it has been, uh, and uh, it is a possibility. I have a few people that are kind of toying around with ideas at the moment, um, and it's all in very early discussion. Uh, we would probably tend to do short film first, and this is working with uh, some people out of uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I would really love to work with uh, Chris Kopesky and also Kat Axtell. Um, I've known them for years, but this last weekend was the first time I had the opportunity to see some of the footage that they've done movie-wise. And uh, they really can pull off some great special effects while at the same time utilizing cameras that are top-notch uh, top quality. You know, everything, uh, when, when, when I first started dabbling in, in video and film, you know, it, it was now you literally can, can, you know, make a movie at home. You can. And uh, as a, and a low budget, uh, it's, it has a fandom of its own because, I mean, if you think about it, some of the most low budget films uh, in my lifetime, uh, they've become landmarks and inspirations. Uh, with what the Blair Witch Project did for uh, found footage. And they only had a shoestring budget of like only $1,000 or so. I mean, they, they really pulled off a lot with that movie where less is more. It's, uh, it's something that I enjoy just as much as the original Haunting. And uh, that's what I, I would like to see more independent audiences um, push further for their favorites to become ranked higher because uh, I'm really not too much of a fan of mainstream cinema at the moment. It just kind of feels like a lot of things are being regurgitated. Um, I'm more of a fan of independent works and foreign films. Um, Edward St. Pei, who owns Weather Vision, bought up a lot of the, the old classic horror movies, and he still distributes them to, to some television stations, but he and I have had some discussion in the past couple of years, you know, about possibly doing because that's what i do on I, i'm really in the wrestling syndication business but i get called by all phone calls from all kind of people trying to syndicate this that or not i do um, well <laughs> it, it goes back to just what you've talked about with your books a lot of it is, is, is networking it yeah. is and uh, also you don't want to just sell your book you want to sell yourself too uh, when you get onto Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whatever it is, you do have a product that you're pushing out there, but if you have a fan base, uh, they're not only caring about that product, they're caring about what's going on in your life. And so this is where you have to share with your audience, and when your audience shares with you, you have to respond with them, and you have to build a platform and a net that isn't only just your fans and readers, but people that eventually become like family to you. Um, what events are coming up close to us? You know, we've talked about the Comic Cons, uh, some events that possibly are in this region of the country. Well, um, I do want to become uh, more active with AVC conventions. They're the ones who did the Jackson Con last weekend. Right. They're doing uh, the Mississippi Con in June, and I have to check on dates to make sure it doesn't conflict with uh, another I have and those and dates as a matter of fact <laughs> I, I was talking to them yesterday um, 
Let's see. I will find it here in just a minute. If, every time I open my email, I just get ten more. <laughs> that's, that's that's the way my life works. But uh, real quick, I had a quick question for you, Dalen. And uh, I, I, you were talking about the movie industry, and it it hit me. This is something I've been talking about for a while. That what is missing is good dialogue, which means good writing, mm -hmm. and which is sad because there's a lot of good writers out there. But it seems the special effects has overcome the dialogue. Go back to Twilight Zone, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Great pieces of work that were driven by dialogue. You were scared to death watching it, but it was the dialogue that scared you, not some special effects monster. Yeah. Um, I would actually say that the last horror movie I saw that really impressed me um, it was The Babadook. If uh, you haven't seen it, it's really worth the watch. I think it's on Netflix. But uh, I want to say it's an Australian film. And uh, there's so much you can gain from that movie psychologically, especially on how the mother and her son play off of one another in regards to the tragic events that are going on. And so you have very great character development with that. Um, I guess as far as mainstream goes, if I had to say a horror movie that I've enjoyed over the last year, um, I would say Krampus would probably be at the top of my list for this year. It, uh, it actually had a lot of heart to it. It had a uh, comedy to it. It had horror to it. And I like how the family interacted together. It, uh, it did have some good character development with that. Um, I'd say as a kid, I really enjoyed uh, just slasher movies that had no character development because I was like, oh, look, blood. But now as an adult, I'm like, all right, that person was just killed. We have no backstory. It's just another random oh well getting back to the comic cons uh jay branch in an email yesterday said the mississippi comic con is next june 25th and 26th arkansas is may 14th and 15th tennessee is february 6th and 7th and updates on the louisiana comic con and sbc anime fest coming soon so yes. i'm gonna be work I'll, I'll be seeing you at, at some of those events next year because we're we're getting very involved in getting our, uh, as you saw, Duggan was is in, was in Jackson this past Saturday. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, I will become more active in those conventions, or I intend to anyway. Uh, the conventions that I have coming up this year, um, I have Mid-South Con in Memphis, Tennessee, and that's going to be in March. Um, also, I will, I, I only uh, list off the cons that, I've already been really grounded with for years, and uh, pretty much this la uh, this next year, I'm kind of cutting back on the con some to open up for new ones and to plan for new shows such as the AVC cons. But um, with Mid South Con, I'll have that. I'll have Imaginarium in Kentucky. Uh, that's actually Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, it'll be in October. Um, I'll have Bayou Con in uh, Sulphur, Louisiana this June, and uh, there's a few others coming up. I'll attend Geekonomicon again on, uh, in Biloxi in December, and then also I'll have MCFC, which is a convention in uh, Memphis in November. So those are the ones that I'm for sure doing at the moment. Now, for folks who locally want to pick up a copy of your books, they're available at Lorelei Books? That's correct. Uh, you can go to Lorelei Books, and she should have signed copies of uh, my previous titles. I don't believe she has on the shelf yet, Southern Haunts 3, but let's see what we can do with that before Christmas kicks in. Well, we want to thank you so much for taking time out to join us and uh, and come in and give a a whole lot of backstory. I, I've gained a lot of a lot more knowledge about you, and, and I appreciate you coming in and, and sharing with our audience. Hopefully, uh, when you get something else ready to put out there, you'll come back and visit with us again. Oh, I'd love to return, and I appreciate you having me here. Coming up tomorrow morning, we're going to be talking sports. We'll be talking the Celebration Bowl, and is this Jay Hobson's last game as the coach of the Alcorn Braves? Right here tomorrow morning. Hopefully, uh, Attorney extraordinaire Blake Teller will be back tomorrow. I'm going to touch base with him later today. If not, Dalen and I, and who knows who we might get on the phone or drag through the door to be talking sports right here tomorrow morning. 
Until then, uh, be careful out there. A lot going on in the River City. I got a couple of news items I'm fixing to check on. Apparently, we had a fire overnight uh, up at the Showtard area. I'm going to check on that one, get some information out uh, on WVBG News uh, just shortly. Until then, have a good one. See you. Kevin is here, by the way. It's Tech Talk time. A good day. He's making almost. Plus, the week before Christmas, the children all.